Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. Your hosts today are me, I'm Jason. And I'm Travis, regular co-hosts. We connect with all sorts of different people, TOs, uh, competitive players, and just um, anyone else that has something interesting to say that they message us and convince us to talk about on an episode. Yeah, we do like making the world a little bit smaller, one hobbyist at a time. We do have a Discord and a Patreon, which is definitely some stuff that you should check out if you enjoy our content. And if you do enjoy this podcast, make sure to share it with your friends who play Kill Team, because... The more, the merrier. You know, this is Kevin. You know, we brought Kevin on from on from Command Point Sigma, one of the famous Thunderdome people on Command Point. He's here to talk about Scouts because he is one of the players who I found who actually played Scouts in the past during Compendium. Additionally, I met him at the first Kill Team Open where he played Vet Guard back at the height of Pathfinder Supremacy. And now as we're walking back towards Pathfinder Supremacy, we figured it's now is a good time to take a look at Scouts. And we'll talk a little bit about Blades of Cain today. Stay tuned for our conversation to break in Kill Team Salvation. Are there uh, like LVO prep tournaments and stuff coming up? Are you playing in a tournament coming up, Kevin? Uh, yeah, we have one this coming Sunday. Nice. Nice. Just our just our local, although by local I mean it is a most stacked tournament. Because <laughs> all the Maryland guys are also coming down. Nice. Yeah, I mean those it tends to be busy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm like trying to decide on what I'm gonna play for LVO right now. It's not just Pathfinders. Oh, uh, you're the Pathfinder I, guy. I know. I probably am gonna play Pathfinders, but I've been enjoying Blades, so I'm gonna go play uh, Blades versus Adrian's Commandos and see how bad it feels. But mm. I'll probably just play Pathfinders. It's like I would say it's most likely Pathfinders, but I haven't lost. A, I've lost one game with Blade so far, and it was very winnable if I were paying attention. So now I'm just kind of like, it's kind of fun to just take them and play. But how many games have you done my... with the Blades? <laughs> I do kind of also want to win, so I might just take Pathfinders. <laughs> you got your Recon Drone, which effectively gives you your Operative back, man. You're almost there was back to absolutely. Launch there was absolutely no reason for them to get the buff. Um, at least not not a, not by my estimation. But we'll see. It is kind of like I probably should just play them in LVO while they're insane again. Just I mean, there's pro- <laughs> there will probably actually be less elites, which is I mean, one of your natural praise, I guess. So maybe that'll balance it out. Honestly, like I played Star Striders at the World Championships a couple times. I, the only time I lost was uh, you know, I rolled I rolled a lot of dice. My opponent, I rolled like no hits. My opponent naturally saved with his four pinball and i was like fine fair that's, that's like, one of my that's yeah. one of my worries about blades is i think they have a lot of really good tools to do really cool techie stuff and then you come in with four attacks and you're gonna flub something bad somewhere yeah i was interested i was surprised uh I'll, we'll be talking about it later in the podcast but i played against four two intercession and uh As in four banshee, shooty actually, or four assault it's four Sorry. assaults two shooty yeah. and i played all banshees and it worked pretty well because hmm. uh turn one yeah basically the banshees are able to chip on turn one so you have uh basically two sets of grenades with balanced so you can run up grenade with balance if you get stunned you, they it forces them to pop uh, they shall know no fear and then if they charge you you've already chipped them a couple wounds and you can parry first so sometimes they don't make it and sometimes you can also risk them losing the fight which is kind of neat did they run uh three tilting shields or did not run the tilting shield, so he was like uh, on the near side. Gotta I was run like, all like, tilting I was like walking him through it, so I it's not it wasn't a good representation. I was just like, oh, this is surprisingly more acceptable than I thought it was going to be. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, that, that's what scares me. In that, yeah, the intercessor, the shooty guys aren't going to do that amazing, but then they're just going to roll up, and you're going to have to hit sixes to crit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 tilting shields would definitely be good, but I was just surprised at the amount of like range output because I did. I have a Dire Avenger double shoot and kill an Assault Intercession Warrior on turn one, which was nice. Damn. Just through, um, just through like the raw extra reroll. So if you get like two hits, two crits, that's pretty hard for Intercession to save out of. Yeah. And if you get one hit, three crit, or one crit, three hits, it's also not bad. 
So as long as you can land the hits. And then Contempt is also really nice because every once in a while they just, you know, intercession, three up saves. Every once in a while you just hit two saves and you're like, all right. Pretty often or you like get you, two saves. It's like you'll, mi- you'll miss two saves a non-zero number of times and having someone get stuck there is really good. Yeah, no, I totally buy that. Yeah, Contempt is just like, it's a very, very nice uh, control of your opponents. Ooh. So you are, my, are you thinking about scouts? Yeah, this is my my Black Templars. So I've got the Marshal for my Sergeant. Um, and then the the Neophytes are my goons. And then mm. my Grenade Thrower guy is the uh, the Flamethrower, the Pyre Blaster. Uh, it's not really shown that well. Um, and okay. the, yeah, so like uh, the guys with the, the Grenade Launcher and the Grenade Thrower are like actual intercessors. My Chainsword goons are neophytes. And then the Marshal with the Combi Bolter is is the Doom Bolter guy with the Power Axe. And uh, I've done a, like a handful of proc, uh, practice games with it. And, and like it's been at least like good, fun, clean games. And like I played against... Um, one guy that is like is decent with Casserkin, it's not like his main, and I, I edged him up by like a point or two. Mm-hmm. And so I was what? like, Casserkin didn't feel completely hopeless. Um, I, I am hoping to play a, ga- a game against like our local like full blown Casserkin specialist. But yeah. you know, I, I think it'll I, be I do fun. Think the scouts are like <clears throat> in an okay spot against the Casserkins, just because you have a high enough wound breakpoint where. You can trade off with the with the plasma and the melt once they come up, but they will probably just delete the first two guys they shoot. Yeah, I think but a like, lot of it's going to come down to if they can avoid your counter shooting. <laughs> yeah. I yeah did you? Did is- you? Are do, are you of the opinion right now that you're going to take like? two like three heavy weapons every game right now no no okay. no yeah, no that's what i thought so that's what i figured that's my biggest thing is like they have these tools but it's just like you're just not using most of them it feels like i think you're at least going to be picking them to match what's useful at some level mm-hmm. like into say we were, we were gaming out legionaries on into the dark i think you drop the sniper rifle i think you take the two other heavies you have basically one pod which has your auspex and probably your heavy bolter and the other one has a no obscuring missile launcher and your basic goal here is you're just going to use triple arms and booby traps to shut down their offense and when they push into you you just shoot them to death and you have the tools to do so but it is going to be very much can you do so on turns you know probably turn two or so or just deny or like them, keep them, keep them off of points on turn one, and then on yeah. turn two, get basically one or two kills with while only losing one or two dudes, and then basically exactly. leverage activations. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of how I feel from looking at it. It's, I think you, these guys are going to pick the game plan. They're going to be picking fortify a lot in scouting. Oh, interesting. Okay, because just because you want to be able to like land a barricade on a midline objective to force your opponent to have to run run through it. Exactly, because if fortify. It, by putting it down, you can block off routes for them to push into you around mm-hmm. your triple arms and booby traps, and you can't do it via your scouting actions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so the only one you, you can't the... do without your scouting actions. So exactly. like, you have to do it in the scouting phase. So I, I have, I have, before even the last update, I thought Fortify is generally the strongest option for any shooting team, mm-hmm. just because how good barricades are at shutting down mo- movement and controlling it and corralling. And you're a 28. Elites are on 32s. That means oftentimes you can make a part between two pieces of terrain where you can walk through and they have to traverse. Nice. And I think that's one of the... Were you using... Did you use designate target? Uh, No. I didn't have the points for it. I wanted to use more recons and infiltrates. Interesting. Yeah, I guess. It's good, but you only have five slots. (laughs) Yeah, you do. I figure against elites, it's probably just going to be generically kind of good. Yeah, I think it's... It's really good, but in this one, I I didn't use any triple arms because mm. this was the six inch deployment, which means with capture, there was no way it was going to do me any good. Yeah, because he would just push his guys forward and shoot my guys if need be, or just not trip it. I did a booby trap. I did the extra CP. Extra CP is amazing. That's forever. I did two recons and infiltrate. Mm-hmm. That let me take a fortify which blocked down another pathway and gave me a forward staging place for my auspex to go to and it let me get other guys into position and have an infiltrate so that i could flip my rocket launcher and threaten him turn one okay and you thought the melee was decent or decent enough 
Yeah. Well, I mean, part of us was there was some fairly cold dice on the other side. Mm. But I mean, scout melee has always been decent enough. You know, three, four, hitting on threes, even with three dice. The knife increases that to four attacks, crits five. You can force crits. You can get rending. You can get cult ambush on your knives. It's honestly pretty good. Wait, I thought your most of the melee is three attacks on threes, three, four. Yeah, so the knife guys go up to four attacks, three yeah, plus, yeah, yeah. three, five. And then you just have ploys where if they have more wounds than you or you're the first one to fight, you get to, to you can upgrade something to a crit. Yeah, yeah. You ha- if okay. you're swapped from conceal to uh, engaged, you get cult ambush rerolls. If they are not ready, you also get rending. Okay, yeah. I definitely so saw that. I definitely throw. saw that. That's like how you beat the elites matchup is you're really coasting on the hitting an unready operative is what yeah. it felt like anyways. And you, you have the ability to do so, and then you just pretty much fix your dice like a no, you're an novitiate. Okay. Since a, good. good perspective, because I definitely am like lower on them overall, but I'm also like, I'm a I, I don't think there. they are. I get to shoot you. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I think they're going to have trouble into the really good teams, but they are just tanky enough and just killy enough that you can charge and not super reliably, but annoyingly enough, mm-hmm. one shot of marine in combat. How do you feel like their matchup is against something like Commandos? So you could basically do the same thing into Commandos, but the fact that they have 11 activations to your 9 means that it is uphill. Yeah, okay. That's, that's my... I like... Blades and Scouts seem very fun if you're playing right around their wound count or you're punching down, but once you go up, it's like... I don't actually think their tools are that good. I, I don't really know how you deal with commandos. Commandos can pretty much bring not quite the same amount of close range firepower as you, but pretty good. They have better melee. They have just a scratch. So you can fix your dice all you want. You just don't quite kill hard enough, and then they kill you in return. Yeah, I'm looking at trying to play eight striking scorpions against commandos tomorrow just to try it. Just because I think Scorpions going into Commandos is not bad when you start the fight, because you theoretically two-shot. I mean, you're not reliant on crits, which is nice. Yeah, you're not like reliant the- on crits, and also you get stun in melee, so yeah. if you charge, get a crit. You do you crit. Doink- you, you get two crits, you doink off a, a normal hit, and you go <laughs> first, which is not bad. And you take one hit in return, and then you kill them, and then you're maybe in an awkward spot, but... If well, you if you don't need to use the stun, the you cool. can kill them and then slink off, which is super yeah. good. And you can do that okay, twice just... if you've got if you're doing pure. And plus, like, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> you can turn off their rerolls, which is just unbelievably strong. Um, I'm interested to hear about how that turns out. That sounds really amusing. Yeah, it's, I'm just gonna try it tomorrow. Just give it a try because yeah. I was surprised at how good the double howling ban or all howling banshees was. Just on um, just through like pure chip damage, like getting yeah. two shrieks. Yeah, I have a theory out. of Banshees, of all Banshees. I think it is probably always weaker than going mixed because Tech Op 3 is so yeah, free. Yeah, yeah. It's the Tech Op 2 actually sucks. Like, <laughs> I was playing against Elise and I was like, I th- I literally cannot score this. Is that one where you have to two. do every single one of your. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's. Mm-mm. It's cool, but it's. I was just like, oh, I'm just going to try this. And I was like, oh, this is not good. Yeah, but that 3 looks is pretty incredible. Doomed. 3 is. 3 is so easy just because. There's almost always a spot for a Dire Avenger to sit in the back. Yeah, like if you honestly, it doesn't even seem that hard if you leave the Dire Avenger at home, it's just slightly less free. No, no, no that's what I did. I just left the Dire Avenger at home as the backline person. No, what I'm saying is you don't even bring one into battle. Oh. You can yeah, you, still, a Banshee within six inches of their drop zone and a Striking Scorpion within six inches of the enemy operative, not quite as free, but it's pretty free. Thing is, the banshees are kind of fragile, so it is like you're kind of playing with fire when you have. Yeah, I think the big thing is that because both the striking scorpions and the banshees have hit it and quit it abilities, Mm -hmm. you can probably use that decently. I wouldn't like run it into somebody who decently out activates you, but the ability of a banshee to hit and then you do a fall by three inch fallback with fly can oftentimes get you out of visibility or obscuring from any clapback. Yeah, I mean, you do have to hit it. You have to hit with a crit. Yeah. So that's yeah. that is, I think, the big weakness of the team. That you have four dice and are reasonably reliant on rolling those fives and sixes. Yeah. Um uh, I, I like the team. I think it, they're super fun. I like them more than Corsairs or Hand, I think. Just because they're more fun. Like Corsairs the low are is... super interesting now. 
the woe is just super amusing yeah. to do. <laughs> like you the slap woe and rain, and man. And you just float over to the next person. Mm hmm. Yeah. Although, yeah, the woe or just rain, you hit something squishy, you kill it, you use that to move forward three inches and chuck a plasma grenade. Like, I, mm. I have a theory of eight Helling Banshees into cults just because you just stun, 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 hit woe, kill, hit woe, kill. Yeah. I can definitely see it. Like, I think there's a fair amount of play, and that's why I was like, I need to play against a good Commandos player with this team to be taken off of it. I'm probably just going to play Pathfinders, but it would be kind of neat to just be one of the people on blades but probably you need to play, play pathfinders Pathfinder. so you can check that win rate up so they nerf them back down so i never have to play against the buff version <laughs> it's just me kevin in the whole region it's just <laughs> it's just me only travis out there single-handedly <laughs> keeping alive oh my god as far as like the scouts go kevin are you know i think a big part of what the scouts are looking like is actually your warrior choice right mm-hmm so, I, you know, I think between you have... the bolt pistols, combat blades, shotgun warriors, and the bolter guys, like, do you think you're ever going to take a bolter? So, I think if you're ever taking a bolter, it's because you already feel like you don't need more melee, in which case I'm seriously looking, considering, do I put a bolt gun on my sergeant, maybe, for that two up, Ooh. instead of a chainsword? As he's a three APL guy, so he can move dash shoot or move shoot dash and all that fun stuff. He's hitting on twos, so it's going to be a decently more valuable shot, especially if he's flipping for it. I think I probably consider that before I start doing bolt gun on scouts. Yeah, plus it synergizes well with the shoot twice thing is is pretty handy. Um, mm -hmm. That's something I hadn't really thought about, um, but that could definitely be worth something. Yeah. I think there there is a lot of value to different setups. Your the big key things are going to be how you put out your forward scouting. In that that's huge. It matters a tremendous amount. The fact that you can basically go like, yeah, I don't like that deployment. I'm going to undo a couple of them is strong. But on top of that, free extra CP, being able to take an APL from an enemy operative is just that is probably one of the big ways they will screw with horde teams. You get to do it one time, right? Diversion lets you yes. just pick someone, subtract an APL from them, which can yep. really stymie some of the early four deployed operatives. Because you're doing it at the end of setup operatives as well, so you basically get to look at, okay, what are their guys that have in a position to go for like the faraway point? Not anymore. Or even just like someone trying to set up to do a shoot action, right? Like they're like behind a barricade on an engage order. If they start with a minus one APL, they either have to take a comms buff or they're just not going to do anything. Exactly. Like, it, they put somebody, okay, he's on engage order, and he's hiding out of visibility. He's going to pop out and shoot. Well, uh, if you want to have him do that, uh, you're not going to be buffing up that demo mine. Yeah, you can yeah. really take the wind out of a lot of sails with, for like, alpha strikes and stuff like that. And, like, you could minus one. Is uh, the vet guard spottery? Does that require two APL? Two? Yes. Two yeah, APL, so then yeah. you could just, like, zap that guy and be like, so I don't have to worry about that this turn. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and the ability to just suck tempo like that is what scouts are about. Oh, man. And then there's there's one other thing that jumped out at me for that, and that is, like, commandos. So, like, the new sneaky git is put the sniper boy out somewhere, and then if he can't switch orders and then you give him minus one APL, he can't shoot with the best spot because that's two APL as well. So if someone is, like, trying to put a uh, sniper sneaky git on you, you can just, like, give him a diversion and just not worry about him. It's I don't know team. if... Well, the big thing is that if they can put him within kind of like nine inches of their drop zone or so, they can always have the knob move up with uh, whatever. They it would have to be the dash. it would have to be the comms, right? Because the comms right. can so actually you, drop you the APL. You can use uh, a recon dash, and you can use their once per game strat ploy to get the dash if you're out of line of sight. You can get that knob places. That's true. So it's but it does force them to spend the knob doing that, or to spend the comms. That's incredibly useful because you are controlling their options you are stealing their tempo you are moving out you're taking points you're putting them under the your guns and it's also them doing several activations so you know you can deploy a little bit more aggro and then move people i think honestly all of these are about putting the triple arms especially on any map where the primary 
uh, objectives that your opponent wants to go to or more than six inches from their drop zone, you can cover the entire objective. You can generally do so in such a way that your opponent can't bait it out with a move dash and then get to safety. Mm -hmm. Which And it also does it until their next activation. So even if they're a higher object, higher activation team, and you they do it with like a late guy. Well, if you win initiative, you just start opening it up, blast them off it. And into any sort of capture mission into elites, it's just going to be vicious. Yeah. Yeah, so you're fi- you think that the actual elites matchup is better than I probably I would have considered it at the beginning. Of I don't think it's amazing. Out. Okay. It's not like I think uh like Pathfinders right now, a lot of vet guard into Nurgle or uh that kind of elites matchup. I I think I am long on the opinion that Zank Legionnaires destroy a lot of horde teams. Mm-hmm. But like I think like Vetguard and Pathfinders do really well into Nurgle Legionnaires. They do really well into your intercessors, that kind of elites. And I don't think you do that well, or arguably Caster can well. But I think that you have enough control here that you force them to start off with getting less primary points. And then you can do all sorts of stupid bullshit to slowly work them down if you don't let uh, them just get into you immediately. Okay, so you but, instead of thinking about the actual weapon choices as the skews that you would take against specific teams, you're thinking about the forward deploy or like the forward scouting options allowing you to shape your game plans over exactly. turns like one through two. And then turns three and choices. four, you're just trying to score with what you have left after the, the deadly ambushing, basically. I think your goal is to collapse a flank. The scouts, if you look at their attack ops, uh, so gather reconnaissance, I think is probably the easiest to do because it doesn't leave you vulnerable to a refused flank, just pushing down one side and making it hard for you to score in three different uh, zones without losing too many guys. But uh, I think gather reconnaissance is really good. It has a tremendous amount of synergy as well with the other recon options. Like, so for, uh, gather reconnaissance for any listeners who are confused about what scouts do is uh, faction tech up three. You reveal it at any turning point, and then you can have a friendly operative score the reconnaissance, uh, gather reconnaissance action for one VP, which is performing it while within six inches of your opponent's drop zone and not in an engagement range of enemy operatives, which synergizes with a couple things here. And at the end of the battle, if the person that performed gather reconnaissance is still alive and you get the other point so the first point is get within six do an action second point is survive and you can do gather reconnaissance with multiple operatives so if you've won a flank like kevin is saying here then you can have like two or three people do the gather reconnaissance option while doing plant transponder or some other stuff right exactly in this case you could do so or you have recover item accessed it is very hard to say no to recover item it's just stupid but after that, you have Surge Forward, which is basically get two scouts within six inches of their drop zone. Easy. You have, as you mentioned, Plant Transponder, which is do a mission action down in the open. Not a huge fan of it on a two APL team, but it can work, be thanks to your out of uh, action movement. And you have Courier, which is generally pick a guy in turning point uh, two or three. Uh, Get with him within six inches of the opponent's drop zone, and then have him within it to go on the next turn. It's lots of, I mean, this is all stuff that synergizes, comes well together to just pushing a guy down to be a little action monkey and just get free points. Yeah, I think scouts should one guy on your yeah. opponent's side of the board. Exactly, and oftentimes just because of the pressure you can put with shotguns and flips and knife melee you should be able to push through one side of the board unless you're doing really terribly or against like a really nasty horde team which is what i think their weaknesses are and you found that blade ambush basically cult rerolls when you come out of um engage to or when you go from conceal to engage and you're fighting a non-ready operative was enough to get your scout operatives over the finish line against even an assault intercessor yes the big thing is if the Assault Intercessor is not running the ability that lets them double parry with a crit, there are 14 wounds. They generally have minus one crit damage. Your knife is five damage on the crit. So if you can charge in, if you can roll one crit on your four dice, which you have a lot of re-rolls between your cult ambush ability and your balanced, you can you then get rending 
And then you can spend another one to upgrade, or spend another CP, that is, to upgrade a normal hit to a crit as long as your opponent has more wounds than you or is the first guy doing a fight action. Or you just use your hunter, who has lethal 3+. Plus, and that'll hit for 4 on the first one, 5 on the second, 5 on the third. You just killed them. Okay, so and that's with the emboldened aspirant play from the scouts, where as you fight or shoot someone who has more wounds than you, you get to retain a normal as a crit. Exactly. And I don't think it's not necessarily the greatest thing in the world, because if you're with only a normal guy, if you do roll that crit and you get the rending and you upgrade, so you've got three crits and maybe a hit, they can, you know, parry one crit and they, they can survive and possibly kill you back. But if you do any chip damage to them before with your crack grenade or shotguns or snipers or anything, it's easy done. And the guy with a legal three plus should just be straight up killing an intercessor on the charge. And did you find that when you were getting charged by the assault intercessors, you felt like there was enough defense or you were able to stick around long enough for you to not just get The fact that you afterwards? are uh, 10 wounds and they do not have native rending, yeah, you can, even if they take you down, you're doing damage on the way down. Right, right. I mean, that sounds pretty good. Are, so you're feeling like there's a good mix of range and melee output on the scouts team right now? Yes. That said, uh, let me preface that with I have had stupid amount of luck throughout the years with scout melee, including punching multiple Harlequins to death on their own turn. So a little bit of salt. But I do think that they have surprisingly good melee that is good enough to keep people from just YOLOing into you. You still will oftentimes lose stuff to dedicated melee operatives. I would not want to charge into a Shrive Talon, for instance. But 10 wounds just beats enough breakpoints on 4 or 5 guys that it can be kind of tough. Don't get charged by striking scorpions, though. Yeah, and one of the reasons why I actually reached out to you originally is because it sounds like you played compendium scouts so how do you like what com can you compare and contrast basically like the two we have rules like now oh my god compendium <laughs> scouts was just shotguns the team you had one ploy that worked on you which was get a reroll well within like three inches of your leader but even then at the base level when everybody was missing out at like 12 wounds outside of custodes and warriors shotguns just did so much work and i think they're still going to do work and you have even better rerolls here and mobility but, I mean, losing a guy sucks. I'll be totally frank about that. Going to the nine guys just means the 10-man wound, the ten man teams are going to be tricky. Yeah, because a lot of 10-man teams also are actually 11-man teams now, right? Like, we went from commandos being 10 operatives to 11 activations and 11 operatives. Star Striders are ostensibly an 11 activation team because they have 10 plus the gun. And then Exaction Squad, also an 11 operative team. So it's not even like there's a ton of 10 wound team or 10 operative teams that you're really going up against right now. So now yeah, going I mean, down to nine definitely hurts, right? Yeah, especially like uh, like Breachers of what, 12 man these mm -hmm. days, I believe. Yeah, 12 man on Breachers. Yeah. Novitiates is what I'm thinking is kind of like your 10 man or your Hunter Clade. Novitiates and Kasserkin are your 10, 10 wound yeah. or 10 operatives. I think even Hunter Clade, you can go up to 11. And I you, think you, you know, go, do you go up to 11 or you go down to 9 with them? It's... Uh, you go from 10 to 11. So you can have 10 with a 5-5 five, five Sakarian, um, Sakarian Ranger, Skitari split, or you can go 4-7 and have more range operatives instead of gotcha, melee gotcha, operatives. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, they, they can go higher than you. I'm not sure if they do because the, their stuff is really good into you. It, sorry getting more of their um uh having five range. guys can run over like run over barricades to hit yeah. you with you know five attacks on threes three five or four five double balances is rough yeah and novies are interesting in that you have all this fun stuff for getting your shots off and your aspects and then they pop the headlights and you're like well i guess that play isn't going off yeah it's basically triple arm still works right because triple arm keeps on uh, so triple alarm puts them on engage for yours but then they use blinding lights and the high beams just turn that off you while that friendly operative is a conceal order it is always treated as having a conceal order oh it's it's an uno reverse one last time of course yeah it is really good the high beams make triple alarm very tough to use the best you can try is use it to you know keep faith points mm -hmm. i think the big thing that's i think it's one of your strongest ploys that isn't just dice fixing is stealth relocation, which is if you have a scout more than six inches from enemy operatives during the strategic plays, you can do a dash and change its order, which is you incredible. Can't use it on the first turn, but every other turn after that, you can play around route, 
or you can play around uh, eliminate guards and mm -hmm. you can play around protect assets basically anything that forces you to care about being on objectives you can mess with that yeah, which i found I, very fun for casterkin so on casterkin yeah. and pathfinders i have found that very good so it's nice that scouts also get to do it i think the other big thing about it is that because you have to change the order that means you can use gunfire ambush or blade ambush again and you can use it to you know put a guy right outside of charge range and then look i'm in charge range now or i was in your chart you had moved up to be able to like move shoot me and now i'm outside of that and if you have climbing rope you can use it to get on vantage yeah. So turn one is about the forward scouting, and then turns two is about the ambushing, and turns three is about three and four are scoring with whatever's left over after all the fighting has happened. Pretty much. It's it's not that different outside of you trying to use your turn one thing to oftentimes turn one, you force a score differential. Turn two, you try and get, get your kills in. Turn three, you're just trying to get that one guy scoring like, you know, six secondary VPs. I think the big scary thing, at least in our plays, was the booby trap. And you were saying in your game it actually went off, right? So booby yes. traps for anyone who hasn't really thought about this or just has forgotten what it does is one of the forward scouting options on scouts. It lets you place a booby trap more than six inches from your opponent's drop zone and more than two inches from each objective marker. Whenever an enemy operative moves within two inches of one of your booby trap tokens, you interrupt the action to roll a d6, adding one if your opponent is doing a, a fast action, basically a charge or a dash. So a casual stroll makes this a little bit harder. But if you get a one through three, nothing happens. And on a four or higher, they take mortal wounds and stop moving, which is nice. And it's equal yeah, to it's, the number you rolled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can get up to seven if they're charging or if dashing they're charging through it. through it, yeah. And just the sheer threat here that you might try and do something, and there is a four-inch bubble of 50 to 66% chance that your activation basically gets wasted and you take a whole bunch of mortal wounds. It is It just lets you play around that force gamble so well. Like you I guess put we're, it, we're expecting that the booby trap is going to do a lot of heavy lifting versus this bomb squig, huh? Yeah, it it could do that. I mean, just stopping the bomb swig or stopping your enemy operative, you can put it just off an objective. Mm -hmm. So if they are trying to, say, move dash secure, well, their moves or their dash stops right off it. Sucks to be you. And because you can stop them, you know, outside of cover. You can prevent them from getting within two inches, stop a charge. It's not something you want to build your entire game plan around, but you want this to be ticking in the back of their head if I do this, there is a 50 or worse percent chance that I simply lose my guy in my activation. And of course, this is another thing. It scales up against elites and is worse against scrubs who just go, wow, you just stopped my little trooper from, you know, walking through. I guess he'll just throw the grenade from where he's at. So with forward scouting, do you feel like you would take different kinds of forward scouting options based on how many opposing operatives are going to be? Because I assume Absolutely. that there's a... Yeah, Tell us a little bit about maybe elites and then hordes, because those are probably the two furthest apart. And then if there's something that meets in the middle, you know, talk talk to us a little bit about. Well, I think the first thing before elites and hordes is you need to check the map and you need to figure out, OK, where are the objectives? Are they more than six inches away from the drop zone? If so, there's a good chance you want two triple arms and a booby trap. If there are ones that are close to their edge, you might go with less triple arms into a horde. Diversion definitely increases in value. As diversion is your, it's after setup operatives, so you can look and see which of their guys is threatening to be able to either do shots, do buffs, take objectives, and you can just be like, you don't do that turn one. Absolutely top tier into hordes. Less useful into elites, especially elites that just want to move down the board. And if you don't necessarily have a mission action to do, because you generally only get two move actions anyways. So someone like Phobos is going to be like, oh, I'm going to move dash mission action anyways. I don't really care. Or like intercession, you can maybe bleed a CP hop for a diversion or it just doesn't do anything. Mm -hmm. And were you always taking devise plan, just the free CP? Yeah, you are so CP hungry that, okay. yeah, devise plan, you got you got to take it. Designated target, you can definitely take into elites. You can take it into Geller Pox as well. Or anything where you really want to make sure that one thing is worried about moving up, right? Because it exactly. disincentivizes your opponent and it also gives you a little bit more control over when you decide to shoot. Because maybe you can save some CP on the first guy that comes out just because he's already been designated. 
yeah, like maybe I don't need to do a gunfire ambush on turn one. I'm going to designate you. I'm going to have a triple arm up. I'm going to have my Auspex guy up. You do anything to put that guy into a position to threaten me with, like, your, say, the leader of the Geller Pox, and I just blast you off the board. You'd even, like, uh, preemptively Auspex scan him? Yeah, well, I would think in general, I've been feeling that you do the Auspex guy late if on a traditional board layout because you want to be able to potentially threaten with like your last three moves, giving him, him an extra APL, he move dashes, flips a guy, and then your rocket launcher, your sniper rifle, just delete them. But uh, you can definitely preempt it if they... You're, only, you're always picking one guy with each of his abilities. So you can definitely do him early if you want to pretty much force somebody who is currently, say, in an obscured position who has anti-obscuring to just move. Like, if they have, say, a uh, sniper that has Ignore Obscuring on it, like the uh, the Krook, and you've already used your uh, minus APL on, say, a Hound because you don't want it doing a move grab on an objective and you could on a uh, recover item. Yeah, on a recover item. Mm -hmm. You can basically say, okay, that guy's going to do mine. I'm going to make the guy unobscured. You have a choice now. Do you move him, or do you have your comms go, buff him, but give me a turn of shooting at him? Yeah, not great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is one of those things I think it's going to matter a lot more on the new kill zone, uh, Beta Garmin or Beta Decima, or whatever it's called, mm -hmm. because you don't you have lots of obscuring, but if you start anybody on engage, the scouts can just pick that guy and say he dies. Yeah, there's quite a few teams now that can say they ignore obscuring and we're going to the new terrain that yeah. uses obscuring as the majority way to keep people safe. Yeah, I, d I don't want to give commentary on the new terrain stuff until I've had a time to actually really play it. And we've seen the crit ops that they've promised. Yeah, but I oh basically am holding I'm holding my tongue until I've tried it just because I really don't know what it's going to play like it. I can look at it and I have opinions, but until I try it, maybe it'll be fun. Maybe I'll play it with a team that ignores obscurity and it'll feel OK. My so big thing I'm interested in is if so the official terrain kit doesn't seem to have any additional terrain in it, but mm -hmm. Salvation does. So are they going to build the crit ops with the Salvation terrain in mind? Yeah, the world the world is yet to know. <laughs> I know that, you know, on In the Dark, we never ended up using any of the other terrain. Yeah. So I would expect not, but we will see. It's, it's what, literally anyone's guess right I now. get it at least on Into the Dark in that it's already kind of cramped outside of a few maps. Mm -hmm. but yeah, this yeah. is like the opposite problem of there's just nothing. <laughs> there's yeah. nothing on top. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to we'll have to wait and see. So you're you're excited to play the scouts. Uh, how was the leader? I know that there's been a lot of talk that the leader is very powerful. A three APL operative that passes APL to someone visible is really good. He's got hits on twos. His shotgun is hits on twos with balance or with balanced. So you know, have you done anything really crazy with him or um, not yeah. yet? I ran with the chain sword. But the general idea is that he's a great melee threat. You get five attacks on twos, four five. He gets benefits from all the other buffs that you effectively can have a relentless rending chain sword which is kind of ridiculous but he's tough in that okay he's three apl you really want to use him to be doing stuff but he's also an apl bank so you want to make sure to keep him alive so there's a kind of push and pull there about how you're pushing playing with him yeah, because if you send him off to die on turn two, you're losing out on the APL shifting and one of your three APL models that can actually shift the like a mid board objective from a couple horde models, which is just exactly yeah. Because otherwise, the team really isn't moving on and stealing something without the leader around. Mm -hmm. Or if you know you can pre buff someone, but that's about it. Uh, I think there's probably also some potential play with the bolt gun. Just because if you're playing on a map that has a lot more obscuring, then having a two-up thing with effectively a relentless bolter on twos and gray knight damage, we know that's good. But I don't, I don't think the shotgun is particularly useful because you can already pretty easily get gunfire ambush. So the balance is kind of being wasted. But the chain sword and the bolt gun, I think, are both worth watching. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I'm excited to see. I'm excited to also, see. Also, eleven wounds is it. really annoying to kill in melee. Yeah, it's a great breakpoint, right? Because you take at least two hits. So defensively, you have five attacks on twos, so you can actually theoretically live through a five five hits 
Yeah, five dice on threes, you can make it through because you can have enough hits to actually block a couple of them. Yeah. Especially like if you're charging, which given your out of activation mobility, you oftentimes can get it. Uh, you're off just going to straight up kill people. Like and we I guess saying- he would also be a solid operative to hold a smoke grenade. So he could like charge fight and then drop the smoke on himself and stay safe. Yeah, smoke grenades are... So you can't uh, drop the smoke if you don't kill them, but yeah. Smoke in general... This is this is a team which, I guess we'll get to the equipment options in a moment, have a lot of good choices. Mm-hmm. But this is definitely a team with lots of choices. I don't know if all of them are good, but there is it's a pretty large armory as far as teams go. There definitely are a lot of bad choices as well. So, yeah, I mean, like, <clears throat> if you if you just like go straight for. I don't know if you just like recon dash two people with with uh, and you do you take two infiltrations. It's like you're probably you don't need to flip orders three times if your opponent is like being cagey. Um, that's just one example of, of I don't know, something that feels like a bad choice to me. It might be or you might. OK, you take a, you get two infiltrates and two recons, uh, one of which via the scouting option and two trip alarms and okay so we've got these guys over here they're overlooking this objective which if you go take it you're going to get flipped and then i can flip you and shoot you overlooking this other objective from vantage and if you go take it i can just count you as engage and shoot you if you push down the middle uh trip alarm maybe it's a good choice i i think the scouting options there are a lot of ways to screw yourself but there's a lot of room for creativity and just forcing bad decisions on your opponent Yep, and you're really gonna watch out for people that have super conceal because yes, oh, super conceal that'll eat you alive as a scout player. Yeah, like Felgor are gonna have a good time because mm, you can just walk up with the bubble and force the scouts to have to run up to you. Yeah, exactly. You just you start with like a shaman on engage or something, or another guy on engage, and you just have the, the shaman walk up or, or sorry, on conceal, and you just put down the aura, and you don't give a damn. So you, they can cover one of those perfectly well. And you really don't want to be anywhere near the goats when they call the herd, push out from that central objective, and then start rushing you down. Yeah, they have even more out of activation movement than you. They can chain stuff. Yeah, because the you... goats can, after they get a kill, they can blood sense a second goat to also chain activate right after. That would just be like a disaster for a scout player, right? Yeah, or they can just, you know, they can charge into with an overrun into a shotgun scout and be like, oh. That you have there, plus your abilities to get uh, all your rerolls don't work when you're on the defensive. So if the frenzy goat charges you, oh hell, you're totally at the mercy of the dice. So what do you think their good matchups are going to look like versus their bad matchups in the meta right now? I think we've mentioned that we don't think that they're going to be like an S tier team, but they will be a good team that gets better if you're good at understanding the meta game because you can adjust your game plan based on forward scouting. Where do you actually think they're going to fall within the meta right now? Who are they going to beat regularly? Who are they going to lose to regularly? I think they're going to be Castrigans. Even if you have less activations, the fact that you have the mobility and the shotguns, you're going to be Castrigans. Just you shoot them with a shotgun and they die. That, that's Castrican it. Castrican killers. We do need a, ca- a couple Castrican killers in the meta right now. Yeah. Um, I think they are going to do fairly decently in intercession. Maybe into blooded. In general, blooded are not quite uh, efficient enough with the shooting. And if they can get into you in melee, they can do a lot of scary damage, but there's still a lot of seven wounders, and knife guys will kill that. On the charge, that is. So you can do a lot of give a guy extra APL, charge, fight, shoot. And do pretty good damage with that. Um... It's not going to be like an auto win. I think Blooded are still going to be tough, but I think Blooded are going to be probably the best of the true hordes. Uh, for, for the scouts to play against, because once you move up to like veteran guard and pathfinders, I don't like those matchups. It's much, much worse just yeah. because you're not safe on turn one. They are safe on turn one. They have enough mobility where they can trip your triple arms and then run away because veteran guard can do move 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 on the turns that they're trying to do and they can move the 10 inches and then basically get like a four inch cut after they tap your trip trip wire right exactly but I also they just feel uh, like yeah, you, you the take most... away SDP or a uh, apl from them exactly. and okay they're gonna have to choose okay do i buff up the demo mine for a turn two thing or do i buff up this 
the uh, spotter so that he can flip somebody. It's either way, it's still bad for you. <laughs> Yeah, um, because between in the breach and GA two, like you can have all of this great turn one stuff set up, but they can move, move, move into the breach, GA two, move over, break the trip wires, run over to somewhere that doesn't matter, and then have another pair of dudes actually do the conceal and steal your objective. So exactly, yeah, and they also have fourteen operatives, which you know that's five five guys that you got to kill past just to get to back to parity, which is rough. So I mean, and you can I even think... you can like plan for that and then just like don't even worry about triple arms against people that you know can beat it and like do the diversion to mess up their APL, um put off the booby trap, like take your extra command point and then like the other two, I don't know, like dash forward a little bit. I yeah, I think uh, into something like that guard, you figure out if you really want the triple arm to do that just to kind of force some bad decisions because the triple arm does last until their next activation, so you can use it to, you know, just get some shots off. But yeah, you're taking the CP, you're taking the booby trap, which is good. You can kill somebody who's dashing through it. And you're taking the uh, CP... Sorry. Fresh my mind at the moment. Uh, you're probably taking some recons. Yeah, device plan, diversion, booby trap, and maybe some recons just to get down the board. Yeah, it's definitely a cool team just because the flexibility is definitely there. Yeah. But they, it does look like they have some matchups that are probably kind of hard. Uh, yeah, I think I think they'll destroy Hearthkin as they are built for destroying Hearthkin. Like, in a lab. <laughs> uh, I think they'll probably do decent against Hero Tech Circle because stop the with your APL down, you basically stop the uh, Blitz. Okay, the nuclear nuclear yeah, missile. Because they have to give the APL first to the Apprentic, I believe, so that they're eating activations. You can have extra flips. You can have a booby trap down the way that he would want to go. It's not fun. All right, but, so uh, solidly mid-tier team with some room for really fancy play. As yeah, I think the they're very skill-intensive in term and they're very just understanding exactly how the map is set up they, they are going to live or die on how pe tournament uh tos decide to make their maps i think like more so than most other teams just because can you set your triple arms in ways that they can't avoid so i've got a question to throw out there do we think the scouts are going to be able to make top 16 at lvo mm, i have no clue what's going <laughs> because jason is out here he, i think he's he's gonna stake his claim that he's gonna try to make it right now I believe in you. Uh, no, you it's still not going to be me because I'm going to play intercession and I'm going to win. Hopefully, uh, at least three out of nine games. <laughs> the goal is not to scrub out. As long as you don't do that, you're a winner. Okay. You know, if anyone on our Discord or Patreon wants to come meet us at LVO, me and Jason will be out there doing our best. I got put in Group B. I think me and Jason are in separate groups, right? That's true. Yep, I'm in Group A. I, I looked at that too. Um, but then uh, day three, uh, everything mixes up and all that. So, uh, it, it's always good to make sure you're not uh, round one against the person you drove up with. You know, that's what the team tags are there for for BCP. So, mm -hmm. make sure to get your team tags in. And uh, I don't know what team I'm going to be playing, but it probably rhymes with Pathfinder. <laughs> <laughs> are you running your Crute Finders? Uh, you know, there are a couple Crute in the Pathfinder. There we go. But yeah. you know, as far as the other other half of Kill Team oh, what, I, One last thing we have to go okay, over go, go, go. with the equipment. In that I think the equipment is going to be one of the harder choices for the scouts each battle. There's a couple of ones that I think are fake. You're never going to take the camo cloak. You're never going to take the heavy weapon bipod. Perhaps. Because the camo cloak, an extra cover save is not worth 2 EP. It, it never has been. Because a lot of the times you're going to be pushing forward, so that you're not going to get cover. And if they're shooting at you at a far, okay, you can get an extra save on it. But oftentimes they're going to be blasting the like your uh, missile launcher with like a plasma or something, so it doesn't matter. It's yep. like moderately useful, maybe into the intercession matchup, but even then I wouldn't care. And heavy weapon bipod, you don't have the uh, EP to spend on a heavy bolter and the heavy bolter is probably like your tertiary heavy weapon on top of that. And you already have gunfire ambush anyways, so you already have that baked in reroll. And it sounds like you're using the ambushes quite a bit. 
Or yes. you're even like expecting that you're going to be hitting them almost every other turn. So the There's ability to put reason. your guys back into conceal with your mobility means that you can really abuse that. And if you are not out of CP by the end of turn three, you probably were not spending enough. But like the. Uh... So do you think there's room to like have a heavy weapons bipodded heavy bolter with a camo cloak and a targeting ocular just kind of like camped out? Maybe like you could make a tanky thing. But again, if they have plasma, it doesn't matter if you're doing that. And like getting no cover is nice. But if you're already using the heavy, that thing, you already got AP one just doesn't. Or if you're using the heavy bolter, you've got P one and you're fishing for crits. Eh. Five dice I on think... threes with a reroll one type does mean that you're probably getting like six, seven dice. So it's not crazy that you get the P1 more regularly. And then the exactly. no cover. Exactly. So I don't think nice. you need no cover that much at that point. Yeah. Like, I would much rather get climb equipment, smoke grenades, crack grenades, extra blades. The, the extra blade, all of a sudden, you are incredibly reliable on melee on your turn and moderately reliable on, when they're charging you. Climbing equipment is just. It's it's one EP. It lets you dash up vantage or just charge off it for free, which is, I think, incredible on a team that has an out of activation dash. Smoke grenades, if they don't have anti obscuring, that's going to save you way more than a camo cloak is going to. Because you can just be immune to shooting in the entire midboard. And crack grenades are just, they're crack grenades. It's hard not to take one. There was a part of me that was really wishing that there was something there with uh, shotgun dudes with camo cloaks, and then you just run up and blast someone, and then when they shoot back at you, you're like, you're fine. But it's really just like the big threats are melee, point blank, or like AP2 anyways, so it's just kind of like, you're 100%, I think you're 100% right there. Once you're within six inches to shoot the shotgun, they're within four inches of ignoring your camo cloak. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. yeah, it's definitely a rough one. Yeah, I mean, I'm. I wish the targeting ocular was a straight up no obscure instead of no cover, but can't have everything. It would be cool if it you could targeting ocular or crack grenade though. <laughs> but they did say that you're not allowed to do that. Yes, that that would be an interesting use because generally they're always going to be in cover of using the crack grenade. Although one of the things I found fun is if you can end you know your your turn like turn one five inches away from an enemy and then you just dash your guy in pop with a or sorry you have to end like seven inches away and then you can move your guy in and then you can just flip use the shotgun and the crack grenade mm. or you can just if you have activation advantage you just run to within uh two inches when they're on conceal and hope you get the uh <laughs> Initiative and doesn't the I mean, aspects also take away retain cover saves? So you could it does. you could just like if you're going for a, a grenade alpha strike, you could um, aspects the guy that you're about to grenade and then run up and hit him with a no cover crack grenade anyways. Yeah, but they have a turn to react to that. Uh, like uh, yeah, I guess against like elites, that's it probably works well. If someone pushes up a little too aggressively, you aspects that dude as one of your last activations and run up and grenade him. Yeah, you'd have to do second to last acting auspex. I think auspex in general, turn one is always going to be your eighth activation because the ability to threaten a move dash track with via the extra APL, or you just, you know, you have somebody who's ready to flip and throw a grenade, you can auspex them, they toss it, all sorts of fun stuff. Really annoying into Kroot because your thing beats Rogue straight up. Sure does, because it is not no cover. <laughs> oh, kill team riders. <laughs> Okay, we can all, you know, all the words are there. They just don't have to be, have keywords so that things can be ignored. And so that the Thunderdome on the command point can be a lively discussion place. <laughs> it's it's the real kill team championships. Yeah, Asari's training with... you. I mean, I think the other thing that is cool is if you backload APL onto an operative, you can set up like a move, Asari's training, shoot and crack grenade on the same turn. So you don't even have to just do it with a, a risky end of turn one movement. You can set it up for turn two. Yeah, just the, the ability to bank that APL and then on turn two, you're going to have three guys with three APL is just great. I think their big thing is just making sure that they can easily have visibility from the sergeant to other things, which is why I, well, I think they're going to be very, very strong into the dark. You're going to have to play a fairly different game because you can't threaten your APL tosses around as much 
but it's not like a like, Felgor have the same issue with called attack, and that doesn't stop them from destroying everyone into the dark. Yeah, I think Felgor have a slightly better strength than in the dark, where all of their operatives are really good in melee. <laughs> Everything yeah. is so much closer on in the dark. Mm-hmm. But I guess the same could be said for scouts in the sense that shotguns are also pretty good on in the dark, where everyone is within range for you to get double tapped on accident. Yeah. I mean, the big thing the scouts have to worry about into 10 man teams and more that can melee is that if you move a full guy forward and activate, they are going to hide in melee as you have no way to blast guys out of melee. So you need to make sure to have a decent number of knives and chain swords to be able to do peel. And speaking of teams that can peel in melee, you know, Blades of Cain, they're looking Already. pretty fun. I will oh. say I've been playing them a little bit and they are very cool. We have a Patreon question asking us about Q list specifically because one of our patrons really loves playing Compendium and basically playing very skew centered lists. So like all Banshees, all Scorpions, all Dire Avengers. I've had the pleasure of playing the Banshees one time against Intercession and they did surprisingly well. I was actually pretty pleased with how powerful they ended up just because doubling up on the aspect techniques does allow you to do some really crazy stuff with Howling Banshees. Like at the end of turning point one, every midboard objective is getting the shriek that that kills. So you can just ding a bunch of intercessors and maybe force them to use They Shall Know No Fear. But if an intercessor comes in with 10 wounds, a Banshee is much better. I think in general, GW hit out of the park with the design for these two teams in terms of what your options are. I love it. I think there was a lot of worry going in. They don't have specialists. They're not going to be interesting. They're going to be bland and boring. And then scouts have all the crazy stuff that they can do both out of activation and before you deploy. And then you have the, all three aspects, each of which has five unique abilities. And then if you go all in, you can double up on them. It's, it's wonderful. I love it. It is a yeah. techie dream. Blades are really not about the unique operatives. It's really about be, can you juggle all five of your abilities at all times for every aspect type. So instead of having specialists, you just have a specialist tree that anyone can use, which is much more flexible and it's, very fun. It's so much easier to like. It, there's so much more there in game for so much less it's like fewer ingredients with way more outcomes and i absolutely love that and i feel like it's an easier thing to like keep in mind and that's like 100 percent like the my favorite ways to play all along have been like crazy skew things where it's like it's like try it's do the most with few ingredients um so like i mean some of the examples that you've probably heard in, in previous episodes like with the the mono corn legionary i just like i like to limit the ingredients and really think about that um or like pure incursors with phobos you've got six space marines that ignore obscuring um and then kind of like similarly it's like you can you can bring a bunch of warriors and it's like we're playing pure banshees and now you've you've got like two of them can fly or like two of them can do the the crazy like charge through multiple enemy operatives and stuff like that and just like i am incredibly intrigued with that and i just think it's really really cool i totally agree it's really like an amazing design scheme and the blades of cane really do especially speak to me i like the scouts a lot like i love my space marines but um the blades of cane look super cool I, if i was doing it i would 100 percent just get two boxes of banshees and and like not even think about the other ones at all and just be like i'm horsing around with howling banshees you know i'm not, I'm not gonna like win anything major but definitely would have some fun with that I, mean, I, mean, I saw the whole announcement they had recently for the follow-up to imperium magazine we're doing combat patrols via hatchet where they send you the different things each week and the premium for their tier two was a chaos space marine demon prince and five howling banshees it was like <laughs> interesting that would be a good addition i will say that the eight howling banshees thing the woe the ability for you to like continue a charge against the horde against any horde team that is terrifying because if you don't get them on turn one they are now in your midline and in your back line all all at once basically unless everyone just hides in the back and just sends like three dudes to go into the midline objectives but that's also not great against howling banshees because they have three apl so you can like charge fight and then just run away so and the other thing is that if they, say, use an in-death atonement or something, you just go, I guess I'll use Reign of Tears instead. Mm -hmm. And then you just dash over them, throw a grenade into their castle. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool because the Banshees 
almost work like four APL models in some situations because if you dash if you charge hit someone with a crit then do a three inch dash it's effectively you got like a free APL out of the the trade and then you can still mm -hmm. do something else and the woe also basically turns you into a four APL operative where as you continue on to the next person with your plus one inch of movement from eminent grace you can just end up in really weird situations where your opponent isn't expecting you which is great and the Exarch being able to double double throw Triskelions into horde teams is a uh, so very cool. amazing <laughs> but you know outside of the banshees there are other operatives like the striking scorpions which i think i've me and one of my other teammates is theorized on in the dark they have probably a, a lot more play than they would look like at first blush just because you can do the normal move through a door and then hatchway fight so you can actually still take your aggressive action so you can take a normal move do d3 plus two wounds then end on the other side of the door, hatchway fight someone, and you can get D3 plus four mortal wounds before a fight even begins. Which oh, basically just deletes almost anything that isn't 14 wounds. <laughs> like, just even a 14 wound model is going to be terrified of that. Yeah. And the thing is, at the beginning of turn one, you would have two operatives on super conceal before you go for that positioning. I mean... I don't feel like there's that many on Into the Dark that actually threaten you to force you to get off Super Conceal Oil. Yeah, exactly. Like, the Super Conceal yeah. is just there, so it's like you have to run up within two inches to deal with them. So a good Blade of Cain player will set the barricades all the way back on the edge of your deployment, and then you just sit those two dudes on a room. No one can walk next to the doors, or they risk the D3 plus four mortals and then starting a fight. It's just, yeah, that's a lot. Especially because a lot of people aren't going to see that D3 plus four mortal wounds coming. Uh, and if they do just run into that, then it's just like happy hunting for the striking scorpions. But you, also know, the you can here. dash and then do it. So yeah, you have the... a 10 inch threat to go touch a door. Yeah. And if you can do that without getting into engagement range, you then fight. Oof. Yeah, it's not not bad. And also then your other striking scorpions, you have two. You basically have three sets of grenades, right? Because you can shoot with indirect twice and then you also have a crack grenade or you have a plasma grenade. So there's there's a lot of there's a lot of play there for all striking scorpions in in the dark specifically. Oh man, that's a way cooler. Just this short little thing has had me. Uh, that's way cooler than I needed to know. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess you know we gotta we gotta brainstorm a little bit on the Dire Avengers. But I think Dire Avengers would be the open take all comers skew list against hordes, just because having two models that can torrent along with having no cover all over your all over the board is just a lot to manage. I got to it's better than torrent honestly because you get to remove the first operative first so they can't be providing cover. Which is yeah. very nice. Although I've been thinking in terms of skewless like one of the always you got to figure out how to beat them is the cult. How do you deal with the cult? So mm -hmm. I think you can run a you know a standard list of you know a, a mix maybe take more banshees for recon you have a dire avenger that keeps them honest in the back or else you can shoot two guys. Or you just take eight Banshees and you shriek them to death because they have very little good ways of dealing with APL down. Or you take eight Dire Avengers and you're just like, we're going to try and shoot you to death. Let's see if we can do it. The Dire Avengers do have some nifty things like the uh, whatever that thing is that is kind of like the between colors it, where you can move and in the middle of a shoot in the middle of the move you can shoot um it, like the, Har the harlequins had that but it's pretty useless with six inch guns doing that with someone that has unlimited range is way cooler so you're just standing behind a heavy ruin at the back where they literally can't see you and then you pop out you shoot you go back and this is like this is like unlimited range indirect where where uh, i mean it's like it's like 40k indirect where you're like mm -hmm. you've got your your uh your giant like imperial guard batteries in the back shooting giant shells at people and you just like can't do anything about it but it's uh the dire avengers are like the closest thing to doing that and uh, like if it was pure you can do that twice per turn which is pretty nifty um they've got the whole torrent thing you can shoot twice you've got your leader that has some shooting that can hit on twos um that the other, combined with the other no cool cover thing with and dire stuff avengers. like that against kind of like the seven wound horde guys is you take four attacks on threes three four as your melee profile so you can actually do a charge with nine inches of movement kill a dude which is not crazy it's not guaranteed by any means but if you're doing the ploy so you get balanced on melee probably you can probably kill a seven wound model some percentage of the time and then now you have a backline torrent shot from like from some spot that your opponent is not expecting mm-hmm 
The other nice thing is that because you are not ending a move action, things that trigger on ending a move action, such as the deadly ambush, you can move up, shoot them, and move right back. Yeah, that is true. So that I is going to be a useful little bit of tech. Yeah, all three of the skew lists for the Dire Avenger, or like for all three of the Blades of Cain Aspect Warrior skew lists, I do think that they all have nice versions of play, and they all allow you to do some really crazy things. It's just that when you look at scoring for the team, playing any of the specific skew lists does make scoring your easiest stack ops that much harder. Yeah, I mean, I think it's... I don't think Dire Avengers do quite enough damage to really justify more than one. I think even with all the stuff you can do on the skew, you're just not going to be able to get it off often enough to make the fact that they basically have rending bolters worthwhile. I think there might be some play in very specific matchups with the Scorpions or Banshees. But yeah, giving up Tac Op 3 is just rough. Yeah, and for anyone who doesn't know, Tac Op 3 is, I think, Martial Harmony. So with your three different Aspect Warriors, if you fulfill two of the three conditions, you get a point and you can do it twice. Dire Avengers just need to control a point, which is basically trivial with six objectives on the map. Striking Scorpions need to be within six inches of an enemy operative, and the Howling Banshees can be within six inches of your opponent's drop zone, which is really not that hard, because on turn one, you can just have a super concealed Striking Scorpion within six inches of a midline objective, which your opponent is going to have someone on one of those, and you should be able to tell before you move that Striking Scorpion. Dire Avenger is almost always going to have a spot in the back line. And then depending on how the next turn goes, maybe a Howling Banshee has made it all the way up to your opponent's side. But the Dire Avenger is always just going to be there, moving between colors, shooting, and then hiding. Yeah, there's no way to stop you from scoring, from finishing that out, unless you basically tabled in turn two. Yeah, in my like five games playing Blades of Cain at this point, I think I've maxed it out pretty much every time. But when I took the skew Howling Banshees list, doing Tac Op 2, where you have to do all five of the aspect techniques in a turn, is much harder. <laughs> Yeah, that seems uh, tough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. honestly, if I was doing pure Banshees, I think I would just do Route, Robin, Ransack, and Assassinate Target, because with the Woe, you you're going to catch people off guard. You Are have you... to take Recon, though. Yeah, so basically... Right, you can take Seek only... and Destroy or Recon, if you're going all, I think. Wait, can you? Oh yeah, Kilton, can you Seek and Destroy or an Archetype Determined? Oh my god, I'm actually so stupid. <laughs> yeah, I think oh, all, all Banshees is there. probably one of the yeah. few times Nerf where you have Recon access and you don't take it. I see. See, I just read the bottom part and I didn't read the top part. I'm I'm silly. Okay, alright, Seek so and Destroy Banshees. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, you route, eliminate guards, Robin, Ransack, Assassinate Target, Headhunter... All very good choices. Assassinate Target even is even better for all Howling Banshees, because your opponent is like, oh, I'm going to have to run away with this, but there's literally nowhere unreachable for eight Howling Banshees. Yeah, because exactly. you fly like, what, what and you, you charge through people. Like, nothing can <laughs> stop you. It's absolutely ridiculous. Uh... Like, I don't... You are squishy enough that I guess you could do Executioner with your Exarch, who has the Rune of Protection, so you could get a just a scratch once. But... I would just take any of the other five. And no, Executioner is, is too risky on eight and nine wound models, even if your yeah. nine wound model has just a scratch. Like, it, she dies a lot. I think every time yeah. that she went out, she basically died. She would almost always get one and a half models or two models, but it yeah, like, only does so much. If you're not scoring route, something has gone wrong. Yeah. Robin Ransack, I guess, could be a little bit trickier just because you are so squishy, but with the Banshee's ability to hit it and quit it with. The uh, Reign of Tears, I don't think it's that bad if you do it late. Eliminate Guards is, of course, always good, especially if they need to hang around a point. Assassinate Target, we just talked about it. it's hard to escape from them. And Headhunter, yeah, you, you often want to be hunting their heads anyways. Take it against every Phobos player. They will never, ever not send their Reaver Leader at you. I think the other thing that you mentioned earlier is if you want to take a skew list, Howling Banshees actually might have some play against Chaos Cults just because mm -hmm. you have so much stun floating around the army. Because you can do Shriek that kills on the first two mutants that come up because they have to move in, into some positional spot to try to do something and you can you know try to get the stun off. Unfortunately, with only eight activations, a good Chaos Cult player will wait. So you're just really just giving them a wide berth on turn one, really. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, they go to the torments and you shriek them. And if they did not go with the uh, winged, 
and they went and said with the Sinud, which prevents you from having your stats decreased and gives you Brutal, which is really good against Banshees because of their whole injured minus one thing on the charge, then you can oftentimes Shriek from outside of their easy charge range, even if they do spend the one APL, or the, sorry, the one CP to give them a free fight. Yeah, so you can like run over, shriek, and then just kind of dance away and pray that that's good enough. So there, there's some interesting play yeah. there. I, I think I still don't think you necessarily do it because having the dire Avengers keeps them honest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. But it's it's definitely it was one of those things where I was just like, okay, how do we deal with the boogeyman? Here's a weird way of dealing with the boogeyman. Let's give it a try sometime. Yeah, I will say that in that Chaos Cults matchup, my Dire Avenger did do a lot of work just because he was able to run over to the mid-board vantage point and get the two-shot off on a bunch of guys hiding behind barricades. And he torrented and sniped off to Cultus, which was great. Mm -hmm. That said, I kind of barely skated by that match just because torments are really hard to deal with, especially because torments can... You get the belly bump, so they do three when they come in, and then they die for D6, which is just extremely hard for eight wound models to manage. I think uh, this Scorpion Skew is on Into the Dark. It's going to be a bit tougher just because Infiltration doesn't play that well with them. Seek and Destroy is fine. Yeah. I, I think you need to go Seek and Destroy as well on them, and then you just need to push in. You have to get that route going. Elementary Guards, Robin Ransack. Yeah. But it, it, like, it, you're not going to necessarily take Assassinate Target as well. Probably they, true. Th- that, that's my gut feeling on this. Infiltration, I think, is just kind of dead on Into the Dark. Because they, if they take uh, Ixie's defenses, but if they know you're going to take Ixie's defenses, they play, put their barricades back. And yeah, it's then, always kind of a 50-50. I think a lot of people have cited that the infiltration play is a thing that people will do. But if you're not doing it, they're losing the barricades. So getting the mind game out of them is also not the worst thing. Yeah, because if you just switch to Seek and Destroy, you're like, all right, well, I get the barricades and you don't. Exactly. Now you're, you're forced to play like very far back because you think I'm taking Infiltration. And then when you first reveal, you know, Robin Ransack or something, you're like, oh, crap. Mm-hmm. So. It's, it's definitely very interesting in terms of what you can do if you just lean into it. Yeah. And of course, you have all sorts of good aspect techniques to help you with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I will. Think, I uh, would... I would say that I pretty much always took I, I do think that the balanced take all comers like three three two is probably a better split than trying to take a skew list, but the skew list have room for experimentation, I think. Mm-hmm. I, I think there's a good chance that you even do you do four three one as well if you want access to recon still with the banshees, just take an extra melee threat. Or maybe mm-hmm. into like some uh seven moon teams you go more with striking scorpions. On that note, what do you think about the Exarch weapons? This seems to be the big roster choice here, and there's so many, and they all look so delicious. I tried the Striking Scorpion Exarch with the Twin Shuriken pistols just for the lulls and like an extra grenade threat against Wormblade. I was extremely unenthused to look at the rules again and realize it was hitting on fours. Mm-hmm. So I probably wouldn't bother with that. I think I'd probably take the Scorpion's Claw Biting Blade just to have the bigger one-shot opportunities on the or- Exarch. And then probably because you want the o- option of doing the two Banshee and Striking Scorpion skewless, you probably aren't doing too many of the Exarch options. The big problem I have with a Dire Avenger Exarch is that you either get long range or short range and you don't get one or the other. Like you can't take the mix, which is unfortunate. Mm-hmm. It's so a I, shame because technically he's buildable in terms of you know the actual mini either way. Yeah, but I I'm at the point where I think I would probably never take the X arc for the yeah. Dire Avengers would be my guess unless I would wanted to experiment with the skew list specifically. If I could take a Shuriken catapult and a Power Sword or a Dire Sword, I do think the X arc would have some play just because you could keep people honest and defend your midline people. But because you only get a short range or a long range version, I don't think it's great. And the four-up invuln from the Shimmer Shield is fine, but it's just fine, I think. Yeah. To be fair, my Dire Avenger Exarch is built with a fully illegal option, so, you know. Yeah. Take, take, just tell them make, what make it is. that what you will, yeah. Uh, but the Howling Banshee Exarch, she gets the coolest weapons, and I just took the Boomerang Blade and the Power Weapon. Oh, the Shiskel looks so fun <laughs> in the hordes. It's just so cool. It's just the coolest weapon. Obviously, I think the Executioner and the Mirror Swords all have, like, reasons to use them, but I think the Triss... Triskelly gives you by far the most 
hype plays that you can do with her because mm-hmm. moving into a horde and double shooting a triskelly is uh i yeah that's that's got to be one of the better feelings in the game yeah you, especially if you're following with plasma grenade or something it's just beautiful yeah actually also yeah. on uh into the dark you're rending lethal five plus because it's torrent mm-hmm. so that yeah. is going to be hard to save and honestly, the Triskelly's melee attack is not anything to laugh at. Six dice on twos means that you can overwhelm pretty much anything. And reap two means that against hordes, you're also getting some value out of that. So I think if I was going to take an all comers, it would be a Triskelly and a power weapon, just so that you have the good melee and the the flexibility. But if you wanted to do the other stuff, I would probably never besmirch anyone for trying I mean, to do so, that. As in, so you take a Triskelly and the power weapon is one option. Would you take any other excerpts on your... Uh, any other howling banshees on your roster or just that i think that's good enough i think right now that's what i'm just testing uh just because it's the coolest weapon the executioner is neat but five dice on twos three seven lethal five is not necessary because you have striking scorpions for that rather than having an exarch need to do it so i my... think the the case of the executioner is pretty much solely that you can hit somebody once for seven rain of tears back and then shoot them in the face Yeah. I mean, but you can do that with the power weapon also. Like, you don't have yeah, to Yeah, it's, do... it's, like, it's a little more damage, but yeah, that's yeah. about it. Yeah, like, I don't I... think of the Executioner is that much better, and then the mirror... But my my operative is... I think the Executioner is the spear, right? So yeah. she has the spear and the Triskelly just because it looked cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's a power spear. Yeah, it's a power spear. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. And then the mirror swords are neat, but like for that role it's like you have the striking scorpion so just use them for that role if you're just looking for one shot stuff you know mm-hmm. i feel like the mirror sword, that's relentless right it's like if the you, mirror sword if you is a power sword with relentless. need like that makes your chances of getting that single crit like astronomically higher yeah so yeah. that's that's like what i think, like what if I you're think taking it's her into elites i think you run the mirror sword like the, uh, you could make a case for the executioner for a hit rain or crit rain of tears shoot or something, so that you don't take a hit back. But I think if you want to run her into elites for whatever reason, which she is valuable into elites as is the striking scorpion X arc, you take the mirror swords and you can just fish for crits. Yeah, I think I would just take the striking scorpion X arc in that situation where I can do the brutal lethal five five dice on twos four six. I'm like, all right, good luck. Mm-hmm. Just doink someone or the biting blade with rending, like you just just go for it. Yeah, um, yeah. It's too bad that the twin shuriken pistols hit on fours because it just means that you're probably just going to get three hits most of the time, which is which is kind of whatever. Yeah, I, I think into any eight womb teens like blood and the like, you just run the scorpion's claw and you're happy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, just the just yeah. The exarch is better at doing the one shot stuff. So like, I don't think I would kit my exarch on the howling banshee side to do the one shot stuff as much. Mm-hmm. And then the Die Avenger, yeah, it's just kind of an awkward situation because his loadouts are kind of poop. Unfortunate. But I guess yeah. they wanted to stick with what was legal in Big Hammer. Yeah, I, I don't know why they nerfed the Twin Shirk in Catapult. Like, it's 3-4 in the compendium, but it's 3-3 yeah. three, three here, and I just don't understand why. But maybe in testing, the Die Avenger Exarch was just shredding elites because it's pretty good if you get to go out activate your opposing space marine player because with your 10 inch starting move you basically can touch all the midline objectives so no one your opponent's space marine can never touch one of them without getting basically destroyed so maybe, maybe like that's in, into that like an intercessor the like you can pop no cover you can do seven damage straight up with him just yeah. using that with or if you had a relentless three four so yeah. i get that's why it drops you to six if you're uh only three three, which is reasonably significant, especially I don't know, because maybe uh, it was just a typo. It, it could, might, it, know, it honestly, might be another case of uh, American versus Japanese uh, <laughs> Strike Force Justinian. The yeah, FAQ it comes be, out and they're like, "Sorry, bro, that's supposed to be three four, haha, ha, lol." It would actually it's supposed to be six seven. Uh, it would change my opinion on the Dire Avenger X arc a lot if it went up to three four, because then he yeah. is really good against a lot of stuff. Yeah. Oh, then then he is. Yeah. excellent and very much worth putting on your roster yeah then i would i would change the, my opinion on whether or not i would take more dire avengers against hordes because yeah dire avenger exarch great against seven wound models in cover because they have no cover or they're getting double shot like mm-hmm. so, yeah yeah being able to output three three shoots with a dire avenger 
with relentless rending. That's that's big game. Yeah, this is part of why I I suspect it was not a um uh, typo, but it might be something that we see to change the balance pass if they end up needing it. Yeah, yeah. I, I I so for what it's worth, I think this team looks really fun. It plays really nice. There's a lot of depth, but I cannot see them being amazing at the high level just because eight activations as we've seen with void dancers is a huge huge handicap at extremely high levels of play space mm-hmm. marines can kind of get away with it because they have the toughness where opponents make mistake and suddenly there's a 15 wound model or 14 wound model in your back line that you have to manage that is just very hard to manage but at eight wounds even if you go in and get a theoretically mostly sure kill you might take three or four damage and if you take four damage anything kills you so I would expect that they still are kind of hard capped that way. Yeah. That said, I think Void I'm Dancers, really looking forward to playing them. Yeah, Void Dancers, I think, do a lot of the stuff just better. Yeah. Because permanent fly, better gunner, just a scary, if not scarier, grenade threat, free CP. Void Dancers are kind of the thing to beat when it comes to elfish teams. But you have enough tech and tricks here that I think you can probably, you know, play out of your tier a bit. Yeah, I, I do think that like a really good Blades of Cain player will do very well. It's just I would expect at the very top end, it just becomes that much harder to manage. Just say commandos. Because mm-hmm. for as many tricks as you have, you have eight wounds and a commando touching you is probably still going to kill you. Which I, mean, is- I think a lot of it probably also matters in terms of general setting your the opponent up places to fail since you have contempt so you can just lock in their bad rolls and you can use that to pretty much you know wipe out a point and you're just looking for a part where either your dice are super hot or their dice are cold you lock in that as a good win and you use your move after fighting or your ability to turn off their rerolls to kill them on their turn and just kind of get some tempo back that way yeah i will say another piece of tension that i ended up feeling was when i was playing actually trying to keep the reroll fudging or initiative fudge roll alive was kind of annoying sometimes because sometimes you had to take a shot with the backline dire avenger that put him at risk <laughs> and then sometimes i was trying to put it on some midline person so there was a little bit of tension there because you do have to keep the operative alive and i think in general the dire avenger familiar. in your backline is probably going to be the best because if you need to take the shot you can always use his move shoot move yeah there was a little bit of tension there but yeah. overall it was it's pretty nice. Honestly, um, if he dies before you need to use it, you probably didn't need it anyways, or you were already lost, I feel. Because if they're pushing into your back line like that and you need to use them, it feels like you're already in a bad way. I don't know. I will say one of the things that's cute on In the Dark for the Striking Scorpions is if you strike and fade, you can do it during your opponent's activation. Oh, that is nifty. Because it is use this aspect technique after a friendly striking scorpion with an engage order incapacitates an enemy operative in combat and is now more than three inches from enemy operatives. You do all the stuff, and it says that you can do it even if it you couldn't during an activation, but that does leave it open for during your opponent's activation. So guard, yeah. so like strike and fade guarding scorpions, that much worse when you're playing the skew list on In the Dark. Oh, I, I like that a lot. That is very dirty, especially with contempt for being able to turn off their rerolls. Like, oh, you whiffed it. I'm going to get out of here. Yeah, I will say one of the best feelings on the team is your opponent rolls a bunch of ones. You're like, all right, we're just going to just just stop there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> just uh, I did do that against a Chaos Cult player just because they hit on fours. So the, uh, the first torment hit me and rolled two hits. And I was like, OK, we're, we're good. <laughs> two <laughs> hits. And then I had a, I, she, it charged a Howling Banshee, I think. So I was able to just parry off the first one. I was like, cool, I live. He had to spend the other CP, but I was like, that's fine. Yeah, no, if it works, CP it works. And two fights on one guy. That's uh, as far as, as far as dealing with cults go. That's a, that's not bad. <laughs> yeah, nice. I like it. All righty. Well, Kevin, thanks for coming on today. Thank you for Talk having in- me on. Yeah, helping us, uh, helping us talk a little bit about Scouts and Blades of Cain. Mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to them releasing. Uh, pick them up, what, a uh, week from Saturday? Yep. Yeah, it'll be actually, you know, by the time this comes out, this will come out on the 7th. So it'll be out the following this weekend. So I'm sure all of us will be looking forward to getting our hands on the new terrain and the new teams. Nice. Yeah. So my, my word of advice for everybody building out the Scouts out there, uh, you have one free Scout to build. I would advise putting a knife on him.
And thanks again to our sponsor, Lester's Workshop. You know, we'll be at LVO, so we'll get to meet the man in person. And for anyone who is interested in running a sweaty tournament, the UTC finals are still coming up January 13, 14. The list submissions will be closed, I think, midnight by the time this podcast comes out. But if you email me um, on the website or on New York Kill Team at gmail.com, I can still get you in. So can also get a hold of him uh get a hold of travis on the discord which if you are not already a part of you should totally join our discord all the cool kids are doing it yeah pretty lively discussion nowadays too so exciting thanks kevin thanks for coming on and we'll uh grab me travis yeah thanks listeners for coming by <laughs>